comes to cheer. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. Um, it's, it's maybe not the sunniest of days, but it's certainly warm enough, so please excuse summer ish attire. It's good to be able to come together in, in God's house to, to praise Him. to to meet with each other and to learn more about his love for us and how we should respond in our lives. Um, But as a a church, we also have things other than Sundays. And there was a notice up. I don't know if there's a slide available about the the, um, lamb course. doesn't matter if it's not. In the autumn, there will be a course, lamb, love after marriage, I believe. I didn't know. We had to keep loving them. I just thought we had to put up with them. But... You know, we're, we're nearly 49 years down the line, so we're, something must be working. Would thoroughly encourage you, I've no idea what the course does, I've no idea about any of it, but I am told by people who I would trust that it is very good, as uh, David nodding like mad here, Ian thoroughly, and Colleen thoroughly recommend it. Think about whether it's something that you would like to do, those of you who are fortunate enough to be married or unfortunate depending how much you need the love of the marriage course think about taking part in that the details are available on the website and on notices and all sorts of places a little bit closer to now rather than the autumn is how many of you are thinking on a wednesday thursday friday could fancy a cuppa because i can suggest go down to the cafe you'll get fabulous healthy meals and deliciously naughty cakes. Food bank, sadly, go, happens every Tuesday. That is one ministry that I feel all of us would love to be able to drop because it wasn't needed. But it is needed, so we do it. We're looking for somebody to help coordinate these activities, help them work together better, help advance both ministries so that we can best serve the people of Wester Hales. If you fancy... Three day a week, flexible hours, part time job, trying to do some sort of organising of this sort of gang of cats that seem to run it all. You know, herding cats is never easy, but give it a try. If you know somebody who you think they might have the skills to help with this, just to, co- to coordinate, to inspire, to look for the next step forward, to liaise with other organisations that so wonderfully support us. And I ask you all to just pray about that. that the Lord will bring to mind somebody who could do this job. To bring to mind your mind or to their heart. This is what I feel I could do for the next couple of years. I'd really ask you to pray about that because it's the two ministries that are so important as we reach out to our community. But they need someone dedicated to organising them and control and just keeping an eye over it. So I commit those two issues to your prayer, the Lamb Course and the Food Bank Cafe team lead job. But actually, we're here this morning to focus on worshipping God, of drawing closer to him, of knowing more about what he means to us as individuals and as a community. So let's stand if we're able as we're led in praise.
And let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we, we come and we, we offer all that we have. And all that we can bring to you is the praise of our hearts, from the oldest to the youngest, from the happiest to those who may be not feeling so good today. For those who are well and those of us who are not. For those who are full of joy or full of sorrow. We come and we open our lives to you, Lord. You know us better than we know ourselves. And we truly seek to praise you. We truly seek to serve you. We truly seek to do your will. What other response can there be to what you have done for us? This whole of creation that you have made perfect. Each one of us uniquely made each one of us loved by you so much that Jesus Christ, your son, lived among us, gave his life willingly for us and rose to give us eternal life. And Lord, that you don't leave us alone, that wherever we are today, whatever we're feeling, whatever we're thinking, the questions we have, the certainties we hold, the doubts we have, the questions we ask, Lord, that through the Holy Spirit, you give us that reassurance of your presence, that you guide us, you inspire us, you keep us. So Lord, as we, as we worship you, as we turn to your word, as we seek to understand a little more of you today, we just ask that we will be so aware of the presence of your spirit. You are here, Lord, but we invite you again. Come into each of our hearts and minds. Fill us anew with that certainty of your forgiving love through faith in Jesus Christ. Give us peace at this time. Give us joy at this time. Give us open hearts and minds to hear what you are saying to us. Lord, it's just so special to come and just have that time of, of quiet with you. And Lord, we don't deserve it because we all make such a mess of what we do on a regular, frequent basis. So now in that silence, hear what we would want to say to you, that maybe we are scared to whisper anywhere else, that the spirit of peace will be with us at this time. And Lord, it's so often difficult to find the words to say. How do we express what we really feel? We thank you, Lord, that you gave us a prayer to say. And we're joined together in saying the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from sin. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I've been on holiday for a couple of weeks. So I've no idea what's been going on here. I've never normally much idea. But I understand that the young folk have been thinking, well, we've all been thinking in the morning about some armor of God. Can anybody tell me anything about that? Big person, little person, I don't mind. Has anybody been paying any attention? What have, what have we been learning about? Just shout it out. The armour of God! Okay, the armour of God. Don't need sound systems. Uh, but what's the armour of God? Yeah, well, you see, that's a different one, isn't it? I think... Just to remind you, because we all need a wee reminder. I mean, some people could read the whole passage like that. Right. We're told, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on the full armour of God so that you can stay, take your stand against the devil's scheme. Then it goes, um, Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Have you heard about that one? Um, anybody been here the past couple of weeks? Yeah, yeah belt of truth, right? Okay. And a breastplate of righteousness. You did that last week. Excellent. Somebody was here paying attention. That's good. Or just thought, well, I better say that because it'll keep her happy. This week, it goes on to say, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Why on earth should we worry about our feet in armour? Well, hopefully I can explain that. I've been unpacking after my holiday. And I seem to have got a bit of a mixed bag of stuff. So if I tip these shoes out, can anybody find me a shoe that we have some sort of use for playing sports? You come and find me one that will do for sports? This one. this one. Oh, yeah. That would be really good because it's got the cleats on the bottom. I'd never fit it and I'd never play rugby again. That would be great for sports, wouldn't it? Um, one that I might wear if I was going to go to a very posh ballet dance. Oh, well done. <laughs> yes, the sparkly one because it's for posh. Um, that one I might wear. That. What might I wear if I was going to do my garden? Oh, I might wear the wellies. What else might I wear? Yes, I might. I would normally wear my Crocs in the garden. The wellies are a bit hot. Um, if I want to go for a, a nice brisk walk. Uh, that one. If it was a summer walk, yes, I would go in my sandals. What if it was a, 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 a more wintry day? What I might wear for a long walk. I might. Uh, you see. I would dare these to go paddling because you get rocky bits in the beach and on the stuff. That's it. That's the one I'd wear for my walking and my paddling and my other walking. What might I do with my trainers? If anybody says run, just, just, no. I'd walk, yep. What if I wanted to go out to a dance looking quite posh in a nice outfit? This one, yeah. Brilliant. And lastly... And I think, you know, these are actually my favourite shoes. What would I do in these? My slippers. Exactly. I feel like putting them on now, actually. My slippers when I just want to sit and relax. Do you think it's this sort of shoes that the soldier would need in the army? Part of his armour. Would he need any of those? Or would they just be no use? What would a soldier need? Sandals? Well, gladiators, back in, in the time that Paul was writing, yes, they would have worn sandals. Do you think they'd have been very comfy sandals? Yes, very comfy. Very comfy. Do you find sandals very comfy for marching over stony ground and things? Yes. Good, I'm glad you do. <laughs> Does anybody else like marching around in sandals? No. No, no. Why? What, do you, what would you do in your sandals? <laughs> You're the same, the tour you... <laughs> Don't stand a chance when you ask people questions, do you? But interestingly, the armour, because our feet are very important. I've got all these different shoes to do all these different things because it's so important to have your feet comfy and your feet well equipped. There's no point me wearing my dancing shoes to go and play rugby. I'd be even worse than I would be without. There's no point me wearing my, my slippers to go a cliff walk. You need the right things on your feet to do the right jobs. And we're told that we need sandals of the gospel of peace. Now, the whole point of this armour of God, remember, it was to fight against sin. It was to make sure we were doing right. It was to take the good news of Jesus Christ to everybody. So what shoes we're told we need are sandals of peace. Because that's the way we can tell people. If we can go through our life bringing peace wherever we step then that's what we're meant to do. If we can bring the good news of Jesus Christ, it can help us and other people fight against sin. 
So I'm part of the armour, a very important armour. It's not any of those shoes, but it's knowing that Jesus Christ died for you, Jesus Christ rose for you, and that the Holy Spirit can give you his peace and his strength. And then the soldier can go marching anywhere and go into battle with all these other bits. So that's, that's what we've been looking at in that. And it's a bit of an odd thing, this armour, and you think, why do we need armour, and why have we got to fight? And that's because there's, all throughout history, there's this, been this battle between people doing what God wanted and people doing the opposite. And how do we learn? And we do through Jesus. Our readings this morning talk of two people that, oh, well, three people actually, one who's nameless, um, who uh, had a bit of a problem because all the Israelites, all their army, all everything else, had decided God said go this way and they must have had really comfy boots on because they were going the other way. And God had to say, oi, come back. And all through the history of the Bible, they've gone with God or they've gone against God. And we're going to hear how God intervened and came down and said, I've had enough of this, but I'm going to show you a way that we can sort it out. So we're going to read in the book of Judges about a man called Gideon who had quite an interesting encounter with an angel. But as we think later, was it an angel or was it not an angel? And you'll go out as confused as I am. So let's hear from God's word in Judges chapter 6, verses 11 to 23. And you can watch it coming up on the board, those of you who are wonderful readers, and if not, just see pretty pictures. Uh, Judges 6, 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abarazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. He said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of the Midianites. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favour in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really me, really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait till you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket, its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. And then we hear again in, in Judges 13 about the parents of a man called Samson, who was a very big, strong warrior, and you'll learn about him. I'm sure you've maybe heard about him before. Yes, Callum, Callum will keep you right about all that. Well done. And he meets with this, or his parents meet with this angel of the Lord who says all about peace and about going with God, not going the way that you want to, but having the strength to go the way you're meant to go. So we'll have a rereading from Judges 13 at verse 15. Manoah, that's Samson's dad, said to the angel, we would like you to stay until we prepare a goat for you. Oh, same as Gideon had done for this stranger. The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering and offer it to the Lord, Manoah did not realise that the, it was the angel of the Lord. 
Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? He replied, why do you ask my name? It's beyond understanding. Then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did, did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. We are doomed to die, he said to his wife. We have seen God. But his wife answered, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would, have, would not have accepted the burnt offering and grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things that he has now told us. We never know when we're going to meet and hear a word from God. And both Gideon and Manoah and his wife had quite an, ex an extreme meeting with God. But for all of us, when we seek to wear peace on our feet, we will meet with God as we walk through our lives. And we will as we continue to worship. Let's stand together. Uh, speaking of words from God, when we were practicing, I... Uh, I felt like this verse might be for somebody here this morning, which is in Hebrews 11. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And I just felt like there might be somebody here this morning who has that longing uh, for heaven. And, and not in a sense of uh, you're low and want to... Uh, choose to end things, just like a homesick feeling for heaven where things are all too much and as the world cracks and crumbles it just feels too heavy and you feel homesick for heaven. So let's just pray as we go into worship. God, we don't want to miss you this morning. We don't want to miss what you're doing today and uh, would you slow us down that we might meet with you and come to you, cry out to you hear from you, that as you uh, speak to say how someone might be feeling, Lord, that that is just you saying that you see and that you hear and that you have seen. And would you bring comfort that this is not the end, this is not it, this world is not all that you have. Would you fill us up this morning?
And let us come to Christ in prayer. Lord, for that wonderful truth that in Christ alone we stand and nothing can separate us from your love. Nothing can come between us. The world might fight against us. It might feel as if we are very alone at times. But thank you for that promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that you came to be as one of us that you didn't remain a distant God. But this morning, as we look at what you were up to before you came to live as one of us, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. That you would remind us of truths that we know, that you will open our eyes to other possibilities, and that you will make clear some of the mysteries that are in your word by the power of the Holy Spirit. So bless us all, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Over the past few weeks, we've been looking at um, theophanies. And I I don't like big words. And this week, we've moved on to the angel of the Lord, or the Lord. And I think we've got a a slide to start us off. And this comes up, and this phrase... When Ian said to me, oh, you can do the angel of the Lord, the Lord. Um, Have we got the pictures? There we go. The first one would be good. One before that. Should be the title one. There we go. The angel of the Lord, the Lord. Now, when you see that come up, What does it say to you, if you're honest? Does it say anything at all? I know for some of you here, it will be a starter for a lovely conversation. And you'll find more big words, and more big words, and words in ancient languages, and links throughout the whole of Scripture. And that is brilliant, and I love sitting, hearing people talking theology. It's great. But is that the case for all of us? I think if we're honest, if some of us see that, it will be, I don't know, the angel of the Lord, the Lord. What? Honestly, I don't know. And for me, and maybe for others, and hopefully this morning, it might start a thought process. Well, what does that mean? An angel or the angel? Angel of the Lord, the Lord, with a question mark behind it. If it keeps occurring in the Bible, which it does, and if we're doing a series on it here, which we are, it must be kind of something to look into. So that's why I'm looking a bit deeper into this topic this morning. We won't go very deep because, you know, that's why. Because when I started looking into it, I didn't have a clue. And the more I looked, I got more confused. But hopefully... I've worked through some of that. So no matter where we're starting, whether we know it, what it is, whether we're not interested in what it is, or where we think, mm, well, it could be, it couldn't be, we'll, we'll have a wee go. Excuse me if I sort of backtrack a bit, because I say I've been away having a holiday for a couple of weeks, and I've missed the learned words of my colleagues. Some of you may be here as visitors or not been for a few weeks either. So on the next slide, I've got some definitions of theophany, the times when God appears to men and to women. And I hope a few definitions may help, but they may confuse a bit more. So we've got a theophany, a temporary appearance of God in a body. I think we can cope with that one. It doesn't say what sort of body. We'll worry about the angels and fires and pillars and things later. I need to look at this one. It is a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament period, often but not always in human form. As I say, we'll we think about different forms. Interesting point there to know is it's in the Old Testament period that these theophanies, these appearances of God happened. Because of course course in the New Testament, God came to earth in Jesus Christ. So he didn't need occasional appearances. But in the Old Testament, theophanies. Now, I got this from a um, commentary. You can tell, it's not my language. Some would also include in this term Christophanies, 
pre-incarnate appearances of Christ and angelophanies, appearances of angels. In the latter category are found the appearances of the angel of, and of the angel of the Lord, which some have taken to be Christophan, Christophanies, reasoning that since the angel of the Lord speaks for God in the first person and a human dre- addressed often attributes the experience to God directly. More confused than when we started? Because as I worked through my preparation, I was. So let's move on, right? There are four schools of thought that we can look at, which is quite helpful. I know there are a lot more than four for my learned colleagues. But as we want to go home, have some lunch in an afternoon and come back to the evening service, if we can just look at four, if that's okay with everybody. So we've got four schools of thought that this is a special messenger, a heavenly being, not God, or God the Father in a divine manifestation to humanity, or there's God the Son manifested in pre-incarnate form, And then I love this catch-all at the bottom. It depends. I can go with that one, but that's not what we're here to do this morning. So let's have a little bit bit further through the four schools of thought. Um, So let's have a look. I know this is maybe repeating things that we've done before or things that you already have, have looked at, but can we have a quick look through some of the appearances of this angel of the Lord, the Lord, and we'll see how we go. So there's just a list of them that will come up. So we've got Hagar, Abraham's wee bitty on the side, if that's not too casual a way to describe her. And this is the first recorded appearance of the angel angel of the Lord, the Lord, in, in the human form. And this being promised her he would increase her descendants. There she was, Abraham's way of trying to get descendants, Not in the way God wanted, but God blesses those descendants as well. It's only God who can bless like that. So this being, an angel, can only bring messages. The Lord can speak to you. And Hagar's response was, I have seen the one who sees me, the omniscient God. Abraham and Sarah, shortly after, had a visit from three men, three angels, and then realised that one of them was the Lord, uppercase Lord, because he promised them the birth of a son against all human odds. And as we know from history, Isaac was was born. And they realised it had been the Lord. And also interesting, when Sarah was laughing about it in the tent, the angel of the Lord, God in a human form, said, I know you're laughing. Can't see you, but I know because I'm God. I know. And then later on, Abraham was being very obedient and taking this beloved son Isaac to a sacrifice that he really thought was going to have to be the sacrifice of his son. And the angel of the Lord appeared and said, no, stop it. You've been obedient as far as I want you to be. I know you're being obedient. But knew everything that was going on and intervened. Surely, if God's told us to do something, the only person who can reverse that is God as well. So the angel wasn't just a messenger, it was God. Jacob wrestled with an angel. We're told he wrestled all night on what he thought was an angel. And then he he realised, actually, he'd wrestled with the Lord himself. And later in his life, made a very clear statement that the angel of the Lord and God are identical. It's another name for God, way of talking about God. We looked at Moses, a story we're familiar with in the the burning bush, and the flame of fire who said, now, you know, a a a bush on fire but not burning, and then it speaks to you. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That appearance in a form, although not human, was God speaking. When leading the Israelites, he promised he would. God said to, through Moses, I'll lead you. 
the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And the name of the Lord was in him. So, there again, the God appearing. Joshua was a mighty warrior, captain of, and the captain of the host of the Lord, with an uppercase, appeared. This mighty warrior. And Joshua realised it was holy ground, and he took off his shoes. Just as at the morning bush, Moses had been told, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. God coming in different forms, in different times, in different places. Sometimes called God, sometimes called the angel of the Lord. So, well, have a wee look now at what, what happened in our readings today, because um, the angel of the Lord was very busy at the beginning of Judges. In Judges chapter 2, he'd already come and um, made a couple of statements. Let me find it. The Israelites by this time had been doing all sorts of things that they shouldn't have been. And we're told at the beginning of um, chapter 2, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant you, with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you do. And went on to give them a right telling off. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these things to all the Israelites, the people wept aloud and they called that place Bochim. They offered sacrifices to the Lord. They had gone so far off course that the angel of the Lord, God, because it was God who'd said, I will lead you. It was Yahweh, their almighty God. And the angel's using, using that language. Anyway, the Midianites had generally overrun them and they weren't doing very well at all because they were being disobedient. And then we hear that Gideon had an encounter with the angel of the Lord. The Lord in then was in human form. The angel was like a man because the verb sat down is used. Now elsewhere we read about angels, these spiritual beings, and they fly and they go on wheels and they do all sorts of things. But this man sat down. Somebody comes in and sits down next to you. Do you presume it's the angel of the Lord? No, you probably think it was a man. And Gideon did. He doesn't realise it is, it is, it's the Lord. He doesn't realise that this man is God because he uses a lowercase Lord. Despite the greeting in verse 12 that the Lord, uppercase, is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon appears relaxed. Would you be relaxed if God came and sat down next to you this morning? There's a few empty seats. I don't think I would be, but Gideon turns to this man, as he thinks, who's said, I am the Lord, and says, pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? The Israelites had turned away and the Midianites were oppressing them. Would you have the courage to ask God, you know, if you're, if you're meant to be in charge, why is this happening? We may be doing our inner hearts. When you look at things going on in the world, you stand and you think, why? But would I have the courage to actually ask God if he was sat next to me? That's a different thing. And the Lord doesn't say, oh, well, it's because of this and because of that. It just says, go in the strength you have and save Israel. Not go in the strength I'll give you, but go in the strength you already have. And the only strength Gideon had, that he was faithful to God. He worshipped Yahweh, not the Midianite gods. He stood up for what was right. And there again, I think Gideon, like Moses, says, oh, not me, I'm not important, I couldn't do that. But God knows when we feel totally inadequate, as Gideon clearly did. And the Lord, the angel of the Lord, God himself said to him, I will be with you. And then Gideon just pushes again. Rather than, I'd be saying, okay, fine. Well, what? Gideon says, well, go and give me a sign. 
I wonder how God must get fed up with us saying, go and prove it, go and do this, go and do that, when we, we don't accept what he tells us. Anyway, the Lord agrees, and Gideon goes off and makes a sacrifice. And when he does, it's laid there. And the angel, this being, God, sitting next to him, gets up and touches it with the tip of his staff. The meat is, and bread is consumed, and the angel of the Lord disappears. And at that point, when the sacrifice was accepted, because that sacrifice would only be offered to God, Gideon realized it was no human and no angel, but it was the Lord, God himself. It was Yahweh. And then suddenly thought, but I know that the penalty for seeing God face to face is that you die. Nobody can cope with it. It's too much. But he'd been reassured, not yet. Your time will come, but not yet. So I wonder, is that God doing a bit of a softening, allowing certain people to see him and know they'd seen him and live? Or was God aware that we can't cope with him in all his majesty? It takes us time to get to grips with it. And he's gentle with us and he loves us. And he gives us as much as we can bear today. And tomorrow he'll give us something more. Anyway, Gideon, in human form, they had a conversation. He was, there was a blessing and he accepted the sacrifice. Our next reading was about Samson's parents. We have Manoah and his wife. But interestingly, the angel of the Lord, the Lord, appeared to the nameless wife first. At this time, they'd, they'd, Israel had moved on. They'd, they'd sort of rallied to God and then they'd gone away again and the Philistines had overrun them this time. I mean, just everybody who was around had to go, I think. Um, and the, the, the angel of the Lord appeared in human form to another woman who was unable to have children and promised her that she would have a son. So is this God saying, I'm, I'm proving I'm God because the things that normally wouldn't happen, I can make happen. This is, this is outstanding. And also gave the lady instructions to how she and the child should live and how the boy's life would be dedicated to God from the womb. And this again was unusual because a Nazarite vow was taken by an individual for a particular period with a particular focus. And God was saying this child I am giving you and he is to be mine so the woman went home and told her husband the, the dear Manoah and I think he probably thought she'd been out in the sun a bit long they were past having children she was un, they were unable to have children we don't know for what reason so he prayed to God in a way sort of checking up God was this message from you Maybe it's a good habit to always test the messages we get because sometimes we do pick up cross wires. Anyway, the Lord said, oh, it's fine. So the Lord came once again to the woman and she fetched her husband and they questioned. Like well, Gideon, they said, you know, who are you? What's going on here? They questioned the man that they met and the words were repeated and again, is that another indication of God's patience with us when we just say, I'm not sure, I'm checking. Can you just tell me again? And Manoah still didn't realise who the man was, despite these wonderful things that were happening. And says, wait a minute, I'll get you something to eat before you go. You'll have had your tea or would you like a cup of tea? Depends where you live, I suppose. So the Lord says, the Lord capital letters, said, okay, but I, don't, I won't eat anything. God doesn't eat. But God accepts sacrifices made with a humble heart. He says, prepare a sacrifice and offer it to the Lord. Still Manoah didn't get it. God's saying, go and make a sacrifice and bring it to, to me. Still didn't get it. Did what he was told. And as with Gideon, it burst into flames. It was accepted 
and the angel disappeared. The response again, realizing they've been in that intimate presence of God, was fear for their lives. I wish we knew Manoah's wife's name because she sounds such a lovely lady. She argued quite sensibly, if God was going to kill them, he would have done it. So therefore, as he'd been there, as he came back the second day, as he'd accepted their sacrifice, that was offering them a promise. Not presuming that what God does in one context, he is automatically going to do the same in the next. When God says something to me, it's for my context. When he says something to Margaret, it's for hers or for Eddie or for all of us. And we thank you, Linda, for sharing what God put on your heart because sometimes it is to share and we each take it for our own, own context. So, two theophanies. Two experiences of this angel of the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, appearing in a human form. So now let's go back and think, which of the four schools of thought most closely fit with this? So we should have, as I said, is is, was he a messenger or was it an actual theophany? In order to test if something is a message or if it is God himself, it's, let's look at what happened. The angel of the Lord identified with God, I am the Lord. He's told us in many cases. In both of these instances, they had the power to give life in many of the instances. Only God can call life into being. So it looks as if this angel of the Lord is God. All knowing, I know what you're thinking. I know you're laughing in the tent, Sarah. I know you're confused here, Gideon. I know you didn't believe your wife, Manoah. And he would judge the earth. Could have forgive sins. Could accept sacrifices. And is this pointing to Jesus, God going to come to live with us? Is this? Or, as many commentators argue, it's actually Christ coming. When I was getting to that point, I was... Um, thinking of the story that Jesus told about the vineyard where it, and, and it, the, it was taken over and he sent, the owner sent messages, sent messengers, do this, do this, do this, and it was ignored. And finally he sent his son and they killed him. Are these the messengers, are these the instances where, you know, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. And then Christ had to come in full form. How different life would be for us living in the New Testament, being Gentiles, not God's chosen people, if things had gone differently. So it would seem today that at certain times God took on a human form to show people something of God. So then... We think, was it God the Father? Was it God the Son? Or was it God the Holy Spirit? Because that's the other thing. It was it Jesus, the Son. And another role, though, of an angel is is as a messenger sent by God. So this title, the angel of the Lord and the Lord, could that suggest that this was Jesus coming? God the Son, was sent by God the Father. Because in John 8, 18, Jesus says, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So the Son's saying, I was sent by the Father. So had he been sent before? Because the angel of the Lord never appears in the New Testament because Jesus is there. So was this Christ coming? Can you see why I got confused? I think there's lots of blank looks and you're thinking she's lost it. And it is confusing. We can accept that God came in various forms, but then is that, how is that pointing to Christ? Was it the precursor or was it not? Were they all the angel? Does it matter? I've got that as a question coming up for you, I hope. Does it matter? Well, yes, it does. Trying to get our head around this, I feel, does matter. 
Because not only does it show us God's interaction with his people throughout history and implies his interaction with us now, but it also shows us, or it makes us think about some of these complexities of the Trinity. Is it the Father, the Son, the Spirit? How does this work? And that's a topic for another day and with other speakers who are able to do this better. But if we can try to grasp some of it or ask God to show us some of it, it helps make sense of Jesus' claims. Because just as the Lord in lowercase is also the Lord in uppercase, the angel of the Lord, the Lord, one and the same thing but a bit separate. So Jesus is one with the Father but also separate as the Son. Jesus says, you know, I'm, the Father sent me. I'm the Son. I'm the way to the Father. So Jesus coming as this messenger, showing people the way to what God's plans were for them. It creates a space to think about the Trinity. These ancient and creative ways of portraying something that is so difficult to get a grip on, this Lord, this Yahweh, God Almighty, this very complex unity helps us understand that God is diverse and yet unified, bonded together in this perfect community of love. If we can start to understand Father, Son and Holy Spirit in the Trinity through these examples of God coming in different forms and doing different things, it creates a space for us to allow our minds to start dealing with how on earth that works. And also, it helps us to know God's character more. I've mentioned a couple of things. You know, does this show us that God was becoming more patient and more tolerant? Did he say that he was understanding human beings' inability to just get on with it? How did we, how did we work? I wonder if when he created the Israelites and said, off you go, he, re, he knew they were going to disobey and then come back. We say he knows everything. But all the details. So the Lord, with the uppercase, interacts on a personal level with humans while remaining his identity as God. God took on human form in Jesus, but Jesus was fully human and also fully God. He never lost his godness. And this complexity and these, these confusions can, if we allow God to speak to us, help us to understand what's going on. So, all clear now? The angel of the Lord, the Lord, the this, that, this, different things, burning bushes and pillars and people. And I think if the last slide comes up, you'll agree with me. Yeah. Realistically, every single one of us is a little bit confused or a lot confused. But I found this wonderful video and I, should, maybe I could have just shown it and gone home. So I'll invite you to sit back and watch this. It's only very short. And ask God to show you what you can understand, to give you a measure of understanding that you can cope with today, whether that's to take it into further, further realms or whether it's just to say, oh God, you're so great and I don't have a clue, but thank you and take away the confusion and worry that you can't. And then afterwards, we just have a moment of quiet to give thanks to God for the love that he has for us, whether he shows it in burning bushes, in wrestling, in angels, in whatever else, that he showed it in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection for my sins and yours. So let's watch the wee video. Reality is made up of two overlapping realms, the heavens and the earth, our space and God's space. And while life here on earth may seem ordinary, sometimes we can encounter heaven right here in our own realm. Yes, this happens a number of times in the Bible. And when it does, we often encounter a fascinating character, the angel of Yahweh, or in most translations of the Bible, the angel of the Lord. Now we've talked about angels. They're spiritual messengers who perform missions for God. But the angel of the Lord is no mere angel. How so? Well, every time he appears, he's described in a way that's purposefully puzzling. And it leaves you wondering, was that an angel sent by Yahweh? Or was that Yahweh himself? 
What do you mean? Here's one of many examples. In the book of Genesis, there's a story about Hagar, Abraham and Sarah's runaway Egyptian slave. And we read this. The angel of Yahweh called to Hagar. But then this angel speaks as if he is Yahweh, saying, I will give you many descendants. And then Hagar responds and says, you are God who sees me. So the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh. But that can't be. In the Bible, you can't see Yahweh or you'll die. Yeah. So this story and others like it are inviting us into a paradox that Yahweh is above all, inaccessible to us. But sometimes he reveals himself to us in ways that we can see and understand. And that's where this character shows up. He's Yahweh made visible to us. Yes, distinct from Yahweh and also Yahweh. This is very similar to other biblical stories about prophets who get a glimpse into God's space, like Isaiah, Ezekiel, or Daniel. And what they see is a glorious human figure on a throne who's called Yahweh. So the one on the throne and the angel of Yahweh, this is the same person. Exactly. Watch all this come together in the famous story of Moses and the burning bush, where we read, The angel of Yahweh appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And when Yahweh saw that Moses stopped to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. So this person in the bush is called the angel of Yahweh, then Yahweh, and then God. And then later in the story, Moses learns that the figure in the burning bush is the one leading Israel out of Egypt in a pillar of fire and cloud. And that's the one who later takes up residence in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, this is the throne room of God himself. You got it. The angel of the Lord is the royal glory of Yahweh appearing as a human. Now, keep all this in mind as we start talking about Jesus. In the opening of the Gospel of John, we're told that from all eternity, Jesus was with God and was God. Distinct from God and also God. That's the same paradox we saw with the angel of Yahweh. Right. And then John says that God's word became human and set up a tabernacle among us. The temple presence of the invisible God. Exactly. Now check this out. There's a story about when Jesus took three of his followers up to a mountain and his true identity was revealed. He was transformed into a glorious human figure. Okay, I see what's going on here. So the angel of the Lord was God appearing like a human and Jesus is God now become a human. Yes, and notice this. In the New Testament, no one ever uses the phrase angel of the Lord to describe Jesus. Why not? Well, they wanted to avoid the idea that Jesus was merely an angel. For them, Jesus was Yahweh God become human in order to fulfill his ultimate mission to fully reunite heaven and earth once and for all. Let's pray. Lord, we struggle to understand some of the mysteries, or most, all of the mysteries of you. It just confuses the mind. It inspires some of us to, to try to unravel the mysteries. It can so easily put us off seeking you at all. But we just thank you, Lord, that in Jesus, we see you. We hear your word. We know your love for us. Lord, we thank you that from the moment of creation, it was planned that Jesus would come and live among us to save us from our sin, to reconcile us with you and each other. We thank you, Lord, from the bottom of our hearts for this overwhelming love that you had for your creation, for your people. The miraculous way in which you, you speak to our hearts and prompt us to turn from our old lives to trusting you. For the way that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, also takes up residence, who also in the Old Testament came and went, but after Pentecost is here for all believers. So Lord, don't let us be confused. 
Don't let us worry about understanding, but just let us open our hearts and our minds and hold out our hands to you and say, Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for my new life through faith in him. And show me the next steps that you want me to take as I seek to follow you more closely. As I'm aware of the things that get in the way and that I do wrong and put those barriers to one side. So Lord, bless us all now. May we know your presence and your reassurance that no matter what we understand and what we don't, your love is real and true and you are alive forever and we with you. Amen. Shall we stand together?
now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in his world. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us and all whom we love, both now and evermore. Amen. Oh, 